Kia ora koutou everyone. Uh, welcome to the Talans Legal Tech webinar series. This is number six um, and the last one for uh, 2020. It's um, with great pleasure that I introduce our speakers today, Curtis Barnes and um, Tom Barraclough. Uh, they are both uh, legal researchers in the Ed Brainbox Institute. Uh, the Brainbox Institute prepares people for impacts and the risks of new technologies. Um, it forecasts emerging developments while combining technological proficiency and with legal and policy um, expertise. And today, they're going to be talking about improving access to justice using digital case law uh, research. Uh, this is a research project um, developed using Open Law Platform, which uh, we've had a previous uh, webinar. I'll just remind you to please keep your uh, mics on mute during the presentation. And if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat. And um, Richmond at the end will uh, manage those and um, present them to our speakers. So without further ado, I'll hand over to um, Tom and Curtis. Over to you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for that, Wayne. And thank you very much, Talems, for having us. Um, Thanks for that introduction. It's exciting to be sharing with you the results that we've come to after a research project which we started in September of 2019. Uh, and it's actually, this research project is actually a continuation of previous research that we did all the way back in 2015. So it's been a long time uh, thinking about these issues. And it's really exciting to be sharing our conclusions because as I'm sure you all know, when you think about something for quite a long time, it's actually quite good to get out of your head into an audience and allow that to be tested. So I'm hoping that we can have quite a bit of uh, Q&A today as well. Uh, I, my name's Tom um, with Curtis Barnes. Uh, we founded the Brainbox Institute, which is a private company, which is primarily an answer to the question, uh, where do you come from? Uh, when you're at conferences and events like this. Um, so we, we needed a home and, and, a, and something to sort of attribute ourselves to. And so that's why we founded Brainbox. Um, we're part of a research team who I will introduce uh, on the next slide. But what I wanna do today is just um, take you through a bit of a, a narrative and a history of how we came to this particular topic area. I'd like to share some of our findings at a high level. I want to point out to this group some of the opportunities that I see for future research um, and particularly use of the open law platform and similar platforms in legal education. And I also, as I said, sort of want to invite some pretty rigorous testing of our conclusions as well because um, it's always good to have some feedback, basically. So, I need to start by thanking our funders, the New Zealand Law Foundation. So this work wouldn't have been possible without funding from their Information Law and Policy Project. Um, that the, the project has funded our research and a lot of other research that has been really important, I think, for understanding the way that technology will interact with law and cause issues or not. And um, I think there's going to be a real gap in this space going forward for funding for that kind of research. So I've, I've mentioned Brainbox is um, effectively a home for Curtis and I to um, investigate uh, technolo technological issues and consider their legal and policy impacts. And we also partnered with Open Law New Zealand, who, as Wayne mentioned, um, were, gave a, a previous webinar in the Talent series. And what they did is they, they have an open source, open access legal research platform that uh, can ingest case law in PDF form, rapidly extract all the text from it, and then use algorithmic processing to identify uh, meaningful bits of text in that judgment. And I'll give you some sort of more specifics about what that means uh, later in the presentation. The founders and directors of Open Law are William Perry and Andrew Easterbrook. Uh, and they have put a huge amount of time and effort into this research project. Uh, the final member of our team is Warren Forster. He's the um, Law Foundation International Research Fellow. Um, 
he has a long history working in the area of access to justice and the accident compensation area. Um, he's continuing research in, in access to justice issues and he was a member of our research team as well. I think I also need to start by um, acknowledging the work that's been done already in this space around um, digital access to case law, um, particularly by the New Zealand Legal Information Institute and the Australasian Legal Information Institute um, as part of the wider free access to law movement, which um, in, in the course of this research, we had some discussions with people who have been involved in that movement. And it's easy to forget, particularly for somebody um, of the generation that I am, that um, it was only recently that, uh, as Osley was saying, you used to have to go to the courthouse and pick up a floppy disk of judgments if you wanted access to them. And um, I'm sure you can all imagine the limitations of that. So I sort of need to acknowledge at the outset that although we make some pretty broad recommendations about how the system of legal publishing should be reformed. It's important to acknowledge the fact that, you know, until recently, actually access on paper was the primary means of getting access to case law at all. So some history to our report and our interest in this area. So in 2015, uh, we had Law Foundation funding to look at access to justice barriers facing people who wanted to dispute uh, decisions of the Accident Compensation Corporation about their, their ACC claims. We had a perception at the time that access to justice barriers were systemic and uh, significant, but there wasn't any data source that we could point to to empirically show that that was the case. So at the time we were working uh, with a barrister called Tiho Miatov and for his honours dissertation, he was looking at the use of dissents in New Zealand. And he was doing that using an empirical research methodology where he read a lot of judgments and um, basically coded them um, for his research. So um, I think it was Warren's idea initially was to use that same methodology to go through large numbers of judgments in the ACC District Court and to use that methodology to identify what we said were access to justice barriers. So examples of that were the fact that the person didn't have a lawyer, uh, they might have shown up but not had any medical evidence. Um, the, we also looked at whether uh, legal materials were cited in the body of the judgment or not um, to get a sense of whether the law was sort of developing as a coherent whole or not. Um, so basically what we did is we had a team of five people. We had a methodology document and we used SurveyMonkey and we randomised um, all the cases that we could find. We downloaded them one by one from New Zealand uh, NZ Lee and we manually went through them and identified these access to justice barriers. That was um, quite a significant report. Um, in hindsight, there's some things that we might have changed about it. Um, but the important thing was that it gave us an empirical basis to make claims about access to justice in a particular jurisdiction. And that was really valuable. And it was um, something that effectively couldn't be dismissed as um, being a case of sort of one bad apple. Um, so it couldn't be said that this was just one regrettable case among a wider set of cases that were, were broadly fine. We, we had the, the data to say, no, we read um, about 500 judgments and these kinds of barriers were systemic. That led to um, an independent review of our research by Miriam Dean QC that was commissioned by ACC and MB and that led to a, um, quite a bit of policy and reform work in improving access to justice for ACC claimants. That was the starting point of this. It wasn't, um, it was primarily about how can we use judgments as a data source to understand what's going on in the legal system. So early in 2019, um, I was introduced to Open Law New Zealand and I had come across their tool before, which was um, an, a Chrome plugin, which lets you um, install an extension to Google Chrome. And when you're browsing the legislation.gov website, you can click a button and what it will do is it will tell you all of the cases in the open law database that refer to that section in the legislation. So obviously this was 
quite significant functionality to have available for free outside of commercial publishing platforms. And I thought that was pretty significant. And um, the idea was to try and replicate the research that we did around our report called Understanding the Problem, but to do it with digital technologies. So the ambition, which we didn't quite realize, was to effectively redo all of the research that we did for our 2015 report using computers. So I think the ambition was to sort of sit back, um, press a button and generate massive amounts of data about the legal system. As I'll explain later, um, we largely realized that ambition, but we also found there were some important limitations to our ability to do that. So um, as I say there on the slide, effectively the software tool can be developed and the tool that has been developed by Open Law lets us generate data about 7,000 judgments all at once. So um, Open Law's passes will identify um, a citation, they can extract all the relevant dates in the case, they can um, extract all the relevant citations to legal instruments in case law, uh, the name of the judge, the name of the parties, and information like that. And um, one stat that I think we should note is that during the course of the research, Open Law upgraded its um, PDF ingestion pipeline, and that works 84 times faster than it did when we started. So it's a significant computational task, which I think a lot of the legal researchers among us might not fully comprehend, and we definitely did another time. But one of the key limitations for us was, sure, this um, Open Law New Zealand platform can process 7,000 PDFs in, in you know, rapid time, and uh, we can generate a, a range of different passes or algorithms to extract the kind of information that we want. But the issue is, where do you get the judgments? So what uh, became apparent to us is that we needed to deal with the issue of access to case law in New Zealand as well, because that was the biggest barrier to people being able to develop these kinds of research tools. And it was also something that we'd previously noted in our research that um, there was an inequity of access between people with access to commercial databases and uh, people who are using free digital sources. So what we did then is we, we took a step back and we focused on the wider system and ultimately the report has been about that wider system with a view to developing these kinds of legal research tools. So it's a little bit small on the screen in front of you probably, but this is a screenshot of the tool that we developed with Open Law. What you have on the left there is a list of cases that have been uh, organized into randomized sets. You can um, pick individual sets using unique identifiers, and you could theoretically allocate those out across law schools in New Zealand as part of a legal research assignment to go through and code these cases and generate data about them. In the middle, you have a pane that shows you um, the PDF of the judgment. So um, it's probably a good example there of the kinds of data that we were looking at and the reasons why we thought a system of legal publishing needed to be updated. You can see um, the, the sort of variability in formatting on that page. You can see there's handwriting on it, which is quite hard for a computer to process, extract or understand what to do with it. Um, particularly also, if you look in the top right corner, the decision number is actually written in handwriting as well. So um, what Open Law had to do was um, upgrade their pipeline to be able to recognize handwriting. You can see uh, in red underline on the central judgment pane that there's a date that has been underlined and you can see the way that that date is expressed. So it's not in a sort of particularly formulaic way where it says 2 August 1995, it says second day of August 1995. So that's fine for a human reader, but when it comes to computational processing, that can be the kind of thing that um, makes it difficult for a computer to generate the data. Um, moving over further to the right hand side, uh, what we have there is effectively a user interface that lets you enter the data about the case. So in this case, what we're doing is capturing a date and we're saying what the significance of the date is. So um, in this case, it would be 
that the date of the hearing is the 2nd of August 1995 and that would generate a, a data point which um, if you have enough of them can then be processed using sort of statistical software or Microsoft Excel. On the right hand side what we have is the variables that we tried to code the cases for. So some of these are more automated than others um, and that was really a limitation of our research method so we, we reached some important conclusions about that as well. There's certain kinds of questions that you might have from a research perspective that are very difficult to reduce to an algorithmic processing level. So for example one of the ways we got around that was the software would identify everything that looks like a date in the judgment, but it would be up to the human researcher to say what the significance of the date was. So um, we tried to map all the dates in the case to map the timeline of a dispute, and we found that that was quite difficult to do using solely automated processing. There are some other ones in there that we tried to transfer across from the previous research project. For example, um, whether the case um, dealt with an issue of medico legal causation is the top one there. Um, and so we, we tried to capture some of those more open textured variables as well. But what we can do with this platform is give everybody a unique login um, and, and track the way that they're coding data about a case to quickly build up knowledge of what judgments say is happening in our legal system. So as I said, um, our focus shifted not just um, focusing on whether we could build this platform, but looking at the conditions required for other people to build platforms too, uh, and to build uh, various kinds of digital processing software. So um, the question we asked ourselves was, how do people in New Zealand get access to case law? And how do they get access to it digitally? What we found was that access could be better. So um, we, I'm curious to know in the comments um, how many people actually use uh, sort of non-commercial publishing software um, on a regular basis. So I'm talking here about the Ministry of Justice um, databases and NZLE, for example. Um, the question we asked ourselves was whether you could get access to lots of judgments and digital processing uh, in, in digital formats um, and the answer is you can't. So most judgments are only available in PDF format. That makes it difficult to process. Um, they, the other problem is that judgments are not necessarily um, set up for digital processing. So there's variability in expression in the way that judges describe things. And I sort of um, dealt with that in, in the early um, bit of the presentation. So here's an example of um, what an ordinary user is confronted with if they're trying to access judgments. So um, here is the, um, the interface that you see when you're looking for decisions of the Customs uh, Appeal Authority, I think it's called. Yeah, Customs Appeal Authority. So as you can see in this case, um, what happens is effectively you're just referred to NZLE. So the Ministry of Justice doesn't provide you with access to those decisions. There's just a search box for NZLE. So I think that's notable because um, NZLE does not receive government funding and only receives a degree of government support. By contrast with that um, set up for the Customs Appeal Authority, you might look at something like the Refugee Protection um, Decision Finder. And you can see here that there's a much um, more detailed sort of range of data facets that you can search by. So one thing, for example, is you can filter by the outcome of a case. Um, you can filter by um, decisions that have been cited, for example. So you get a much um, greater level of um, data quality, effectively. And one of the questions we asked ourselves was why um, you, and researchers outside of ministries don't get access to that kind of data. Um, so obviously someone somewhere has created this data set about these refugee protection decisions and it would be really helpful to have access to those for, um, for research purposes. In some cases as well, uh, this is from the Employment Court 
and effectively anything before July 2006 can only be obtained from a commercial supplier. Um, there's an interesting note here as well that says that if litigants are going to be placing a copy of a judgment from NZ Lee before the court, don't print the HTML copy because I'm conscious that um, judges experience this situation where self-represented litigants will show up with an HTML copy of a decision, which is very difficult to read when it's printed out. Um, and I just think that's notable because um, effectively the role of NZ Lee in our system is so significant that the Ministry of Justice itself has to um, give directions to litigants about how to use the information from, from NZ Lee. One of the other things is that even if you can get access to individual decisions, you cannot get access to large amounts of decisions at scale. So this is from the disclaimer on the Ministry of Justice website and the bottom bullet point there says that you must not carry out any data collection activities, including data mining, data extraction and data harvesting. So open law, for example, does know how to um, come up with a script that will extract all of the decisions from a particular database using the Ministry of Justice's website. But that's not something that's actually uh, permitted explicitly by the terms of use of the website. So um, the point about this is, even if, I, even if we could get access to individual judgments uh, from the Ministry of Justice site, and we could process those individually, we can't get access to all of them at once. Um, and that, that's a limitation of being able to use the kind of open law platform that, we, that we've developed. So there are good reasons why we don't have access to case law on mass at scale for everybody who wants it. And one of the questions that we asked ourselves as well was, um, we don't accept this about legislation. So um, various jurists would agree that if we have secret legislation, um, that's not good from a public policy perspective. But for some reason along the way, we've accepted that um, if you don't have access to case law, then we're not as worried about that from a public policy perspective. So we asked ourselves why that was the case. And one reason we got to is because legislation is different from case law. And the reason it's different is because uh, for two reasons. One, it's part of a dynamic process. So publication of case law can um, undermine the administration of justice or the integrity of justice processes. Case law can be subject to suppression orders for very good reason. And then the second aspect of it is something that is faced by the free access to law movement all the time, which is that judgments include information about real people and there are privacy implications of publishing that information. And I think we have to bear in mind as well that the whole point of a judgment is that the facts included in it are correct. So it's not as if we can um, say that there isn't going to be a significant volume of personal information included in a judgment when we publish it. This is something that um, has been acknowledged before and, and it's a significant issue in this space. So what we came to was this. Um, if judgments are going to be available at scale in digital systems uh, for, for widespread use in legal research or, or any other a number of purposes, they need to be prepared for use in digital systems at the time they're created. So what that means is um, that one of the ways that that can be done is that they can be marked up using XML, which is uh, extensible markup language. And what that does is it effectively include, it uh, integrates unseen digital tags into text. So um, what could be done is that when a judgment is published, um, dates are tagged as dates. Uh, citations can be tagged as citations. The names of the parties can be tagged and effectively what that will mean is that judgments are suitable for computational processing and computer systems can be programmed to understand the significance of particular strings of text in a judgment. So this is actually not a particularly new idea um, which was quite interesting to me 
uh, there is an existing standard which effectively organizes the way that you incorporate those XML tags, and it's called Acoma and Toso. Acoma and Toso was developed by um, the UN, uh, UN committee, effectively, and it was created for use in organizing information across African parliaments. So it has elements that are intended to organize information from a range of legal sources. And that's important because the way that we organize information about legal sources has to pay close attention to um, the way that that information changes and we can't effectively sort of um, rewrite cases or rewrite legislation without changing the significance of that for legal purposes. So the Acoma and Toso standard has been uh, investigated uh, in the United Nations as a means of organising legal information um, and it's also been investigated in the European Union for basically managing the, the large amount of legal information in that institution. There's also been a uh, programme in the United States to mark up legislation using Acoma and Toso. So there is precedent for using XML in this way. There's a very good body of academic research behind it as well, which is important. So we're not really suggesting that we reinvent the wheel with any of this. We're just saying that there's an existing standard that could be applied. One other interesting finding for us is that um, there is a judicial publishing system used already by the judiciary, and that's called JDI. Um, that interfaces with JDO which is the, the publication interface that you will be familiar with. But JDI is already basically a content management system and it's based on um, open source software called Alfresco. And so JDI, to our understanding and having spoken with the software provider, could be amended relatively easily uh, to incorporate this kind of functionality. The way it would work is a and Toso creates a separation of roles between an author and an editor. So effectively judges or other tribunal members could go about writing their decision exactly the way that they normally do, but a separate step would be added whereby the judgment text itself is marked up by an editor using this um, XML, standardized XML basically. We say that this would have really significant benefits for a range of things. So what it would do particularly as well is let the author of a document as the people closest to a case to indicate using XML what information is suppressed or might be private. So um, rather than taking a judgment and publishing it with a, a wide suppression order, actual the specific information could be could be tagged using xml and we say that that kind of functionality would actually be able to be used for tracking suppression in cases so by marking up judgments for use in computer systems using xml you overcome the main barriers to publishing judgments on mass which are privacy and suppression so you could start to automate redaction and effectively uh, give privileged access to different versions of a judgment, one of which might be um, redacted and the other might be fully unredacted. Because the judgment is a data source with intelligent tags in it, you could also automate the redaction around dates. So for example, if there's an interim suppression order that lapses upon, upon a particular date, then uh, the redaction could be removed um, with semi-automated processes. So not completely without human oversight, but um, with, with uh, I don't know, more intelligent use of digital systems than might occur now. So the benefits of marking up judgments in this way would be uh, wider access to legal materials because we can have more confidence in our publishing systems because citations and cross-references between documents are going to be standardized and tagged, you could have linked legal materials. So you could have this sort of um, what we're used to with commercial databases where you can link back and forward between um, different cases and cases and legislation. You could have public-facing um, databases that are also capable of doing that.
you could build the kinds of legal research platforms that we have built with open law. Um, if judgments are available as data, then that opens up the possibility that that data can be used in legal technology applications. So, um, you know, I hesitate to sort of speculate about what they would look like. But the point is that you can build software on top of judgments as a, as a data source. Uh, I've mentioned the benefits for tracking suppression. So um, not only the cases subject to a suppression order, but also the information that is subject to suppression could be held as a data set and accessed by external organizations. So for example, the digital tech platforms could have a much closer understanding of what information is suppressed and in what cases. Uh, and that also has benefits for sort of automated redaction. So, as I said before, this idea is not brand new. Um, it's something that Donna Buckingham recommended all the way back in 2011. Um, and the point there is that unless we adopt uh, this method of preparing judgments uh, intentionally for digital publishing, we're going to um, wind up in the situation we have now where if there's any doubt, effectively a judgment is withheld and that limits public access to judgments. Uh, we're also interested to find that um, this notion of publishing judgments in a machine readable form um, is something that is being picked up in other common law jurisdictions. So in September 2020, not that long ago, the Liddy Data Trust was announced and that is effectively um, a massive data source of, as it says there, all judgments published by 43 Canadian courts over the past 30 to 50 years. Uh, including rich case law metadata. So the idea is that you can access that data, you can do interesting things with it from a research perspective, and that's a, a public good. Um, the, the top extract there is an extract from our report, which um, is being released tomorrow. Um, we also found that access to machine readable judgments was something that had been recommended in a report by Dr. Natalie Byram in relation to the United Kingdom. So Dr. Byram, was commissioned to do a review of the data strategy for the court system in the UK. And Dr. Byram recommended effectively what we have recommended, which is that the current system of judgment distribution be mapped and that there be um, collaboration among stakeholders to work towards a situation where judgments are published as um, structured machine readable data. Um, interestingly as well, this was just from today actually, um, the, there's a um, piece of legislation before the House of Representatives in the US, which is about access to case law using the PACER service there. Um, I've just put this in here to sort of show that it's um, something that's developing all the time globally, um, and that there's a, a big focus on free access to case law in digital formats. So um, we're talking about marking up the judgments, but then there's also this question of how the public access the judgments once they are all marked up in this way. And what we would need to have um, as some kind of access controlled system, which we effectively have now, except with um, less control over the level of access that is given. So, um, what we would need to have is basically a privilege system of some kind where, for example, the media, the law society or lawyers might have access to unredacted judgments, but the wider public might have access to redacted judgments, uh, but in methods that still make them useful for them. Currently, the way um, the system works as far as we've been able to ascertain is, is primarily by attaching PDFs to emails. And we say that that system can be improved. One thing to note here is that the Legal Information Institute uh, network is part of the free access to law movement. And one of the important principles of that movement is that people need to be able to access primary legal materials without being subject to unnecessary surveillance. So we're conscious of the fact that when we're talking about accessing primary legal materials as data and having some kind of access controlled system, it's good public policy to not have people subject to surveillance when they're doing that because people need to feel free to access that information. Another interesting area of research that we came across though 
is the way that um, algorithmic transparency um, is being investigated in the context of commercial and other legal publishing platforms. So um, in a really interesting article by AJ Martineau, um, advocating for the kind of court-authored metadata that we are recommending. Uh, Martineau covers work done by Susan Nevelo Mart, where she submits the same, re the same search query to multiple different legal publishing platforms and receives very different results from each of those platforms. So this is attributed to basically the opacity of the algorithms being used in search but also the way that the different platforms are affixing metadata to individual decisions. So we can wind up in this situation where um, the same person submitting the same search query receives different results. And we need to think about that from a public policy perspective. And I, I note that the way that open law works is that it's open source. So anybody can see the search queries that are being created. And so there's some public policy benefits around that. Um, we couldn't look at access to case law in New Zealand without considering the role of the New Zealand Council for Law Reporting. Um, I came across this quote from, I think, the Attorney General, as he might have been then, or, or then later, later became, um, sort of referring to the fact that there's not that many people in New Zealand who have a deep and abiding interest in law reporting, um, and we think that's notable. So. The Council of Law Reporting is a body that has a limited statutory monopoly on the ability to publish law reports. It's had that um, limited statutory monopoly since 1938, and it was last reviewed in 2006 in an amendment act. So if I direct you to section 12.3 there, that's a provision that limits the ability for um, new publishers to be able to publish law reports. Um, one of our recommendations is that the system should be examined again uh, to consider whether it's um, suitable for um, what we currently want from our legal publishing system. The interesting thing about legal publishing is there is a difficult sort of constitutional balancing act to be um, taken into account. And the constitution of the council and its membership reflects that. So, um, the council is made up of a nominee of, well, the attorney general or a nominee, um, a nominee by the chief justice and the solicitor general, as well as members of the New Zealand Law Society. So there was indication in the passage of the 2006 Amendment Act that there is you know, room for some sort of constitutional political argy-bargy um, around who gets to decide what case law is published and so we're conscious of that when it comes to publishing judgments as data as well. We think there's room to consider whether the Council of Law Reporting's role could be expanded or reduced depending on how our original, our eventual system of judgment publication winds up. So, um, forgive the sort of somewhat rambling presentation of our findings. But um, essentially that's where we've wound up. We, we think judgments need to be published in New Zealand as uh, machine readable digital data. We say there are ways of doing this. We say that it can be done in New Zealand with relatively little disruption to the judicial system as it is now. One of our recommendations is that there be um, a closer sort of investigation of how the system currently operates and then um, the development of a pilot program, uh, which we say could be done in one of the lower level tribunals, just to test how a system of publishing like this would actually work and to iron out any kinks in that system. Uh, and once that has been trialed, there's no reason we see why it shouldn't be rolled out in principle to the wider justice system so that um, New Zealanders can get access to primary legal materials on um, an equal basis with people who use commercial publishing platforms. Um, this is obviously quite an ambitious set of recommendations and we are sort of conscious of that. So what we've done is also in our report pointed to some implementation mechanisms that could um, give, you know, get a foot in the door 
on legal publishing. Um, the first one of those to note is the Government Centre for Dispute Resolution. So the GCDR is based out of MB, and what it has been doing is developing a set of model standards for dispute resolution systems. Those standards are intended to set out sort of best practice for the range of dispute resolution systems across government. And one of the important standards in there relates to the ability to keep data on how that system is operating. This sort of feeds into MB's wider regulatory stewardship function as well, um, where it needs to monitor the health of regulatory systems, which sort of links all the way back to our original research around um, the operation of the accident compensation dispute resolution system. Another sort of implementation mechanism that we've identified is the Open Government Partnerships Action Plan. Um, and that is uh, coming up for renewal. But in previous action plans, uh, there has been inclusion of goals around publication of secondary legislation uh, and algorithmic transparency as well, separately. So we think that investigating a publication system around judgments as data is something that would fit well in the Open Government Action Plan. One other thing which I haven't touched on yet is the way that um, publication of judgments as PDF limits their ability to be used in accessibility um, software. So generally speaking, uh, publishing a document in PDF format limits the ability for people with visual impairments to use it uh, in screen reading technology. So basically publishing in PDF format can have an exclusive effect against uh, people with visual impairments. That means that um, another way into this work at a policy level is the work around digital accessibility standards uh, and the wider program on accelerating accessibility reform in New Zealand. We think there are reasons why the legal profession should be interested in advancing this work. Um, for one thing, it will provide uh, free access to a much wider range of judgments. For another thing, um, it will, there, there are benefits arguably for client protection in the sense that um, suppression orders can be given effect to in digital platforms. And we've seen recently the way that um, publication of information and breach of name suppression can have effect on criminal trials in New Zealand. Uh, and we also think it's sort of consistent with the, the Law Society's role in the Council of Law Reporting and its um, lawyer's broader duty to facilitate the administration of justice. Uh, the New Zealand Council of Law Reporting is obviously a good place to consider this kind of work as well. Um, it's an institution that's already set up for this purpose. It includes a diverse membership from people across the various arms of government associated with legal publishing. Um, we weren't able to find out too much information about how the council operates. We had limitations on how far we could dig into that, but um, we think the council for law reporting could be a good place to start. And then the final institution that we point to as an implementation mechanism would be the parliamentary council office. So legislation in New Zealand is already held as structured XML. And so basically that's a government organization that has experience working with XML, manages legal information and could have a lot of expertise in this space. So that's all I wanted to cover in the presentation today. Um, thank you very much for your patience in, um, in getting out what is quite a sort of complicated set of findings. And really what I'm keen to do with the time available is hear your thoughts on our conclusions because um, one of our core recommendations going forward is that the system needs to be investigated and tested quite robustly. So thank you very much for your time. Okay, can they see me? It's Richmond, uh, we here, I don't know if you can see me, but it's fine, you yeah. if you can hear me, that's, uh, that's quite all right. Oh, actually you can. Uh, right, so um, thank you very much, uh, Tom, for that, and thanks, Curtis. I saw you uh, uh, writing out a, a message there before. Uh, I'm here to manage the questions, um, so I know that the chat box is there for you to type the questions, but um, really anyone can type it there now or um, put it to Tom. 
Okay, we've got one from Vernon, a ver message from Vernon. Let us just digest this. Uh, I'll, I will read it out uh, anyway for all of us. Um, Vernon says, thanks for a great presentation. Devil's Advocate question, has your team considered the negative consequences of encouraging non-professional legal research and advocacy slash representation by untrained, unqualified persons that would be encouraged and supported by the kinds of open access platforms that you're exploring? Is there an explicit and implicit quality control benefit for research and legal representation that results from making judgments, et cetera, hard to get, only accessible via university law libraries, law firms, research centers, et cetera? That's a really good question. Um, we, we did consider the, some of the risks of making judgments available in this way. To the first point about sort of a, a sort of beneficial implied exclusionary um, arrangement of the system, I think if that's going to be something that we decide is beneficial going forward, we should state that and test it. Um, I don't know if that has been um, actually stated and tested before. And I think there's no reason why we should treat our, you know, we should treat the, the system of legal publishing as a policy system and we should decide what we want from it. And then, and then we should sort of test whether we want uh, a sort of qualified exclusionary effect to be part of it. Um, we did note issues like digital inclusion, for example. So just because we're making access to judgments as data available um, doesn't mean that everybody will magically have access. Um, but we did think that sort of digital inclusion would be better um, under our suggested system than it is now. Um, I think there's this other point that we tried to make in our report that um, what people do with these judgments once they're available uh, widely as machine readable data is a separate question from whether they should be made available. So one area that we considered in particular was the way that overseas there's been controversy about using AI and sort of predictive analytics on case law data to um, predict the outcomes of cases or to assess um, performance of lawyers and judges, for example. And where we came to with that was, um, sure, there may be um, some good reasons for um, caution or concern around uses of judgments in that way. But that's a separate question from whether we should be making them available at all. And I think we um, can't get away from the fact that we're talking about sort of primary legal materials. Um, so if, if we do decide um, after a system, you know, a, a program of investigation that we would like um, the general public to not have access to judgments because we're worried about what, we'll, what they'll do with them, uh, then that's fine. I think we just might need to defend that publicly. And I'm not sure that that's ever been done. If I can just jump in with another suggestion and point, Tom, is that when we looked at the access to justice barriers in the ACC system, we recognised that access to representation is also a, a barrier. So it's not just uh, the, the law, um, but also the, how that applies to your case. Um, one thing I will flag is that I run a dispute resolution system now called Talk Meet Resolve. And one of the key things for us is communicating to individual people who are having a, a dispute what the law actually is. And if we have that independent expert in the middle, using a publicly available source like NZ Lee or the kind of stuff we're talking about here, um, by just having um, listened to the expert because they're the expert compared to, here's what the expert says about the law and here's how it applies in your case, um, the person, if that, if that law is transparent and it's visible and they can see it, and if they can write down the, the key bit for them or the conciliator can do that. Having that law available makes it much easier to explain to the person in a way that doesn't, you know, that they have some trust and some confidence in it. So I think there's a separate issue from, um, from making the law accessible uh, and, and that is how does it apply to the individual case and expertise is a key part of that and exactly how we structure that is something that um, we need to resolve, but there's a number of different ways of doing that. But having it publicly available and transparent, um, I think is a very good start.
Thank you for that, Warren. I should say I agree with those comments. Uh, certainly, they give us quite a bit to think about. Have we got any other questions? I've got a little one if nobody else has got a question. It's quite a minor one, and I know I yeah, can always please. sum it up with Tom. Um, can we go back to that implementation slide? And I do know you've got uh, a report uh, coming out tomorrow. Yeah, I'm looking at all of that, and I'm, of course, looking at the various uh, other organizations to which they are connected or affiliated with, uh, and you mentioned a few of them. But where does the Ministry of Justice uh, sit uh, within you know, these bullet points? Yeah, great point. Um, the Ministry of Justice is at the center of all of this, obviously. Um, what we found sort of frankly a little bit difficult as external researchers was to understand who's responsible for what in various parts of the system. Um, and that's sort of behind our um, recommendation that the system should be mapped by somebody who, who has the level of access required to do that. Um, I also you know, want to emphasize that it, it's, a, it's a tricky system. It's, it's really high stakes to publish judgments. There's really significant implications for trials if they're disrupted. Um, there's really su significant implications for privacy if everybody's sort of um, worst possible moment in um, the legal system is available publicly for everybody to just peruse at their leisure. So um, it's really high stakes and there's a reason why, why the system works the way it does. Um, the Ministry of Justice has a really crucial role here, but I think also, um, you know, other actors in the space are the democratically elected leaders of the ministry who have to sort of exercise some leadership on this. Um, and also the, a space for the judiciary as well, because it's the judiciary that are going to be affected by, um, by any policy reform in this area. Warren. Can I just jump in very astute point, Richmond? Um, Strategically, from my perspective, and, and again, this isn't something that we've said outright in the research. Um, the GCDR has been working, we've been working with them um, with various hats for over a year now to develop uh, some standards. Uh, they are now having some conversations with the Ministry of Justice about the Ministry of Justice coming in and adopting those standards too. The, the, the place to develop these ideas, my impression, and strategically where I think we can really get this started, isn't in the High Court or the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court. It's in something like the Motor Vehicle Disputes Tribunal <laughs> or something um, at, at the other end of the spectrum. The, the reason is that that's a place that we can develop, test, and all of these things that we're talking about on the screen here apply there. And once we've proven it in that um, low stakes model, we can then start escalating it through the system, literally system by system. Um, what we're talking about is part of standard nine, the maturity model of the GCDR standards, which will be launched next week, specifically we talk to the kind of things that we are discussing here today. And when you're looking empirically at how systems work, which is what is going to need to be part of the reporting of each of the dispute resolution systems in the future, this is a space that they're going to go into. But Jumping in and saying the High Court or the District Court needs to start this tomorrow, um, I think is a very bad way strategically uh, for us to build these ideas out, test them, and then start to organically grow them, uh, rather than a sort of a forced approach through various ministries or courts. That's my view on how we can most effectively bring about the kind of changes that we're discussing in our research. Thank, thank you for that, uh, Warren. I, I, I have to say I agree with you, but uh, I'll be interested to hear some questions there. I think the point there you're making is that it, it is an evolution. Uh, it's a step-by-step -step, uh, change, uh, really bottom-up. Um, and I, I, I really like that, that um, recommendation quite a lot. Uh, but it's not about me. I'll, I'll say that uh, in my hands here, if you can see the camera. I think the camera is still on, Warren, but that's okay. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to have uh, received uh, an embargoed copy, which I've, uh, I've been going through. Um, personally, I think it's a good read as to uh, what points are being made and how actually the points are being made. 
the numerous um, findings and recommendations there that have been very succinctly and effectively put. So I'd really invite uh, all our attendees here to have a look and uh, to, to share them widely when that's available. I'll just say that uh, when I browse through uh, many parts of the uh, reports and findings, I thought to myself, but of course, why have these points not previously uh, been articulated uh, like this? And why have they not been said uh, this way? Uh, for instance, there, when I, I look at your, if I may, and I think we're within the circle uh, where the, the embargo would be uh, on it, uh, Tom says at the start of the uh, press release that uh, these decisions, uh, the court uh, and tribunal decisions, that is, are the law of New Zealand. People with commercial subscriptions have more complete access to these decisions than the general public do. We wouldn't accept this for legislation, so why should we accept it for case law? Um, I thought that was uh, put very well. Um, I do believe the research report will be something that, that many of us uh, can support and draw upon in helping make the case and encourage action to enable greater access to justice. Uh, some of you may know I've been involved in the legal research area for a bit. I do feel that this is a fundamental part of the uh, legal infrastructure, if you like. Uh, in terms of accessing you know, primary sources. Um, so one of the recommendations that came out, it may sound something as simple and basic as, uh, let's just have a uh, look at the whole system and have, have the judgments met. Uh, I think that's a brilliant one. Uh, it does require work. It's probably not very sexy, but I can see that the aim of it would be, for instance, make it uh, machine readable. Uh, and we can then start to realize and do a few other things uh, with this. Uh, with a view of increasing uh, access to justice. Um, I'm conscious of the time, but I think there might be some other questions. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, exchanges on chat. Um, I'll keep uh, mm -hmm. As Richard said, we're, we're the report is released under embargo now. Um, feel free to get in touch if you'd like a, a copy in advance, but it will be available tomorrow. Um, and we're really conscious of the fact that this is sort of the, the starting point for a much longer process. Um, there's a whole other issue about how we're going to make judgments previously published available as data as well. So our system is primarily prospective. So um, there, there are some exciting sort of legal research opportunities there about how you might automatically apply a coma and toso to judgments. And Open Law New Zealand is sitting there ready to go to, to do something like that. Um, so it's the starting point for a much uh, sort of longer discussion. We've only been able to take things so far in the time available. Indeed, uh, I think you've done amazing work, uh, the team of you, uh, including with uh, Open Law. Um, we've still got a bit more time, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this too, uh, that the recording for this webinar will be made available, but probably a week. It, it takes us uh, just a, a short period of turnover to uh, lightly edit it, uh, by which time the report will be, will be out. But sort of within the circle too, um, well, when we set up this, uh, this webinar, I had not uh, anticipated that we would be uh, doing it virtually on the eve uh, of your report being made uh, public, Tom and um, Curtis and Warren. Um, but there, there are two things I should mention before I, I, I thank a number of people involved with this. And that is a quote that's been attributed to, uh, to Warren in the press release. Uh, and Warren says, once judgments are available as digital data, a whole new world of research opens up. And uh, I was really quite excited uh, when I saw that. Um, Curtis um, says that um, while judgments are not subject to copyright, the official law reports are. In many cases, that means that the government is actually paying a commercial entity for access to its own work product. So, um, I'm really looking forward to the uh, general public discussion when this uh, report comes out tomorrow. Congratulations on putting out such an excellent work. And I see that Curtis in chat has indicated there's uh, further work uh, coming out in January. Um, so I think I'll just wrap this up by um, saying a series of thank yous. Um, thanks to the uh, presenters who uh, many of, well, both of them are, are with us for the second time after the uh, presentation on, on the deep fakes report. Um, a few weeks ago. Uh, that project, just as this one, uh, both were funded by the Law Foundation. 
thank you to all the attendees uh, today. I recognize many names today that I've seen that have registered and participated in previous Talents webinars. Uh, the Talents Project hopes you have found the webinar series useful. And after Christmas uh, and New Year and next month's holiday break, the webinars will commence in February or March. We wish you all a safe and relaxing holiday. And lastly, thanks to the Law Foundation, which is also the funder for these Talents Project. The foundation support has enabled initiatives like this webinar series to be made available widely and freely for public access. Thank you.